Let's step away from the drama of the moment and turn to the recurring theme in many of the largest recent collapses. Coindesk has a new opinion piece out from Amanda Cassett that reads in part, in an echo of the 2008 financial crisis, the collapse of FTX has triggered a run on the banks across crypto markets. Despite sector-wide sell-offs, Uniswap, Balancer, Curve, and other decentralized exchanges or DEXs and decentralized finance platforms have been functioning smoothly, enabling users to buy and sell their assets even amid the turmoil. Traders may have seen their portfolios decrease in dollar value, but they never lost access. If that isn't consumer pr protection, I don't know what is, end quote. I think that this is a really central point, although not without its own nuances and challenges. Exchanges like FTX are better in lots of ways when times are good, but when things start to go wrong, that lack of persistent, unavoidable transparency lets them avoid public awareness of it, which means the problem can often grow from something that's very small and manageable up front until it drags customers down into the giant hole with them. Zach, Nephi has its own downsides, obviously, here, but at least this isn't one of them. What's your read here, and is this, is this or is there any solution? to this type of problem that exists out there in the world today. I think this is a fine thesis and this may be a fine silver lining of the collapses that we've seen in recent months. But I think by and large, most people interact with the crypto economy through centralized players such as Coinbase, FTX, Kraken, Binance, you name it, right? So in some future state, I think there is a robust DeFi ecosystem that gets us away from this interstitial phase of like all the bad stuff from TradFi with additional risks associated with crypto <laughs> yeah. and two, like all the good stuff associated with truly decentralized finance. And again, peer-to-peer -peer internet commerce without the need for intermediaries beyond a smart contract that you're interacting with on the internet, right? So I think there may be some end state in which this plays out in its ideal form. But right now, I think we've seen such a hurdle toward mainstream adoption of these on-chain tools that if you were to sort of poll, I don't know, I would guess say seven out of 10 active crypto users, most of them are going through these trusted third parties that they use to interface with some of these on-chain pro products. So I think that long run, again, I think this is the appropriate thesis to be pushing right now. Hey, you know, this is another example of why DeFi might be better in most instances. But again, those hurdles around self-custody, those hurdles around smart contract exploits and other uh, tomfoolery in the, in the Web3 space, those things loom large as it relates to getting more people using these things as they were intended to be used rather than going through these trusted middlemen who provide access to some of these tools. So, yeah. Fingers crossed, but again, as I mentioned yesterday, I don't know if, my, if I'm holding my breath. I don't, see we're gonna, I don't think we're gonna see a stampede to DeFi just yet, but maybe it would be great if ultimately we did. Jen? I think Vitalik tweeted a few months back, we spoke about it on this show, that maybe we're just trying to achieve that mainstream adoption and onboard this next billion users too quickly. And that's why we're seeing all of these problems. I don't think he said exactly that's why we're seeing all those these problems, but that's what I kind of deduce from that statement. I think we should continue building these products, solving problems that exist in the real world, solving the problems that led to this contagion that we're seeing now. And we don't really need to focus on onboarding the next billion users. I think we need to focus on making sure the technology is secure and usable. And that takes time, right? So I, yeah, I think that now, and I hate to say it, but we should just continue building and, and, and not, um, kind of encourage everyone to put their money into a system that still has a lot of, uh, break points. Adam. Yeah, I again, like I think as a rule, uh, I think it's really, really hard at any time, bull markets or not, uh, for me personally to recommend, you know, people investing into any of this stuff. I think that, again, it's something that as an individual, you can make a choice about. But whether it's been in good markets, whether it's been in bad markets, I've always regretted giving any investment advice to anybody in my personal life, because then I feel a sense of responsibility to it that, again, oftentimes, like you just need to understand the risks. And it's hard to do that when you're working off a recommendation. So I think the other thing that I want to say here is that, you know, whether we're talking about the cryptocurrency ecosystem or the traditional finance system, uh, you know, really what we're looking at here is is a distinct, uh, I think, repudiation of the efficient capital thesis, right? So the idea that when you have money, you should be deploying it maximally uh, to make as much money with it as possible. I think that what we see in the world of DeFi is that the things that act in that way 
they're the things that wind up going bust and exploding because the economics support it when it's good and then they implode when it's bad. And you look at projects out there, you know, like MakerDAO, you look at these collateralized, uh, you know, like uh, stablecoin projects where they have 150, 200 percent, you know, collateral behind each one of those things. Those are the platforms that have been stable and they provide meaningful value. They're not efficient with capital. But if that means you don't lose everything because either, you know, a smart contract game theory implodes, you know, or one of these exchanges that's just trying to kind of do everything, uh, you know, or fill a hole in a different company, as appears to be the case here, you know, like if that happens, then that, that's, that's not a good thing. So again, for me, I, I increasingly, as I get older, uh, find myself becoming more and more risk averse and more and more comfortable leaving capital in places where it's not necessarily like earning yield, but at the same time, it's also not at risk if things just happen to go poorly for a couple of days, whether or not I'm paying attention to it, whether or not I'm involved with it. So I think that's, that's what I really hope comes out of this. And again, not just about crypto, this also affects banking. This also affects kind of all of these different places where this is just the, the rule rather than the exception. Zach? Yeah, I think MakerDAO is a fantastic example, right? This is a quiet project that has soldiered on through all sorts of financial crises, both caused by the traditional world and caused by crypto contagion. Stuff like that that is boring, a bit unsexy, a bit inefficient, and also not wound up in the personality cults that we see in this space points to a future where DeFi could be something that is meaningfully important to how you interact with your finances. And I think that dream is still a ways off, but that dream is I think what motivates a lot of people to continue working in this space, right? Where there are tools on the internet that anyone can use that provide bank-like functionality for managing their finances and growing their wealth. So I think again, if that's the North Star that I think a lot of people in these bear markets are building toward, I think that's absolutely a noble goal to be reaching for. I hope we see uh, more egalitarian usage of DeFi or widespread usage of DeFi and less of the self-dealing that we've seen in DeFi to date among a small community of power users. So yeah, DeFi remains really, really promising in my opinion, but that's certainly not to say that there aren't challenges ahead to making it work efficiently.